Okay, good morning, everyone. And good morning to those online as well. Let's uh, just pray and we'll begin. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful day, God. We thank you for giving us yet another opportunity to come and learn. And Lord, we just commit this day into your hands. We commit our hearts, our spirit of God. And Lord, even as we Lord, just receive from you, pray, God, that everything that we learn will be fruitful in our lives, oh God, that we will see a change. We will see our lives being transformed, oh God. We thank you for what you have done thus far and what you're going to do in each of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last class we did up to chapter 91, and uh, I was going through the notes. So from chapter 92, this is section 10, uh, a lot of the chapters are repeated, right? So there will be a couple of chapters I, I just may move on. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to complete uh, as much as I can this this class, and then we'll close for this course, right? So whatever is remaining, most of it is repeated. So you may, you can just go back and read it. Uh, but I want to finish the course this, this, this session, and then I will post the uh, assessments on the Google Classroom as well, right? So... Let's just continue from chapter 92, and I may skip uh, a few chapters just to help us to cover as much as we can, okay? So we talked about an inheritance, right? Uh, we talked about God, that he has, he, he has given us an inheritance when we believe in Christ, and he has qualified us to be part of that inheritance. Everybody know what inheritance is, no? Yes? Right? Something of the... Parents goes to the children automatically. They don't deserve it. They don't earn it, but it's an inheritance, right? Ephesians 1, 3, we talked about blessed with every spiritual blessing. Every blessing that is there in Jesus Christ is available for you and I as believers, right? Ephesians 1, 3. Uh, James 1, 17 says, uh, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So we are blessed with every blessing. Then chapter 96, we talked about being enriched by him, meaning, remember the Lord Jesus, what did he say? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you are not connected, if you're connected to me, you will bear fruit. If you are not connected, you will not bear fruit. Yes? Right? So imagine a vine tree. If, if you're not connected to the main stem, you will not bear fruit. If you look at it, any plant, right? If you're not connected to the stem, you will not bear fruit. So here, when we talk about enriched in Christ, meaning... Everything that we have flows out from him, right? So when we have gifts and talents and the gifts of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, it is through who? Through God, through the Lord Jesus, right? Nothing is of our own, right? Uh, so it says here, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 5, that you are enriched in everything by him. He has enriched you. Now, it is our choice to continue to be connected or not connected. That's our choice. Right? But when you are connected, he enriches you. And when he enriches you, you will bear fruit. You will understand your potential uh, that God has given you. Chapter 97, again, we are always triumphant. Many of us, people ask me this question, right? When the Bible says we are always triumphant, meaning we are always victorious, but why is it in life as believers we see so many failures, we see so many challenges, right? Now, the answer is we are living a life in a world where the enemy is working, right? So we will fail. There will be times we will, uh, you know, we will fall. There will be times we will feel weak and weary. But we are triumphant in Christ when we put our trust in him. So even in our failures, when we say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that even this season, you are faithful. Who's victorious? In the natural, it looks like a failure. 
but for god it is a victory best example is the cross right when you look at the cross what is it does it look like victory or does it look like failure what does it look like failure or victory yeah. it says here that in victory pastor in christ thank you gertrude in christ we are what triumphant we are victorious so the devil will come and say hey we are a failure so what should you say yes what will you say oh because you're in that situation in that season it may look like a failure but you're not a failure you're not like even as leaders as you know being pastoring church in in the church there are many times we feel like a failure but rem remember that ministry and christianity is not about how we feel it's not a feeling i can feel weak i can feel happy i can feel anointed but it's not a feeling it is faith right we do, it's it's not only emotions it is faith we have to believe it are you understanding what i'm saying right so we are always triumphant and then in first timothy 6:12 paul is saying you fight the good fight of faith now it doesn't it look like a contradiction in first second corinthians paul is saying you are triumphant in christ you are already victorious but in first timothy paul is saying you fight the good fight then we can ask paul no you said we are already victor victorious why are you saying fight the good fight that means what every day of our life we are to walk in that victorious life will there be failures yes as leaders as pastors have we faced failures many times but we stand up again we say god you are with me help me to be victorious help me to walk in that identity right and that is something that we have to do then we are born to overcome and when we talk about overcome it means not only in the spiritual but overcome in our mind overcome in our body overcome the situations every area of our life we are called to overcome right now imagine this you're in ministry okay and you're doing ministry your church is growing your ministry is growing but you're not able to overcome certain thoughts in your mind right nobody knows when people look at you they'll say jai masi ki praise the lord pastor ji but in your mind there is still in in the mind there are still areas where the devil is still working strongly we have not overcome that means what we have allowed the devil to work in our mind and we are not living this overcoming life but outside it looks like we are strong remember i mentioned this god will work even though whether we pray or not pray god works yes or no right he will in spite of us he will work right but we are called to overcome in all areas of our life say all areas not one area right not just one area we, we must be able to overcome in our mind in our thoughts in our words you know i've i've met people and these are well meaning believers they come up to me and say uh i don't know why but when i open my mouth i speak lies it's not required i'll be talking normally suddenly i'll say something it's a lie i don't know why it's not required it was not needed but it's what can you tell them said we must have control we must overcome the words that we speak we must be wise in the words that we speak uh, that again is an ability that we must develop right sometimes it's not only about talking it's about just keeping quiet yes or no yes okay then we have the promise of life we are sealed with the spirit okay i want to stay on this chapter 100 sealed in the spirit 
Okay, let's read Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, everyone say this, sealed with the Spirit. Now, you know, when you imagine I give you a document, right? A, a, a Bible college document. I say, this is your Mark's card example, right? Now, the, if it's just a paper with your marks, is it holding any value? Why? The seal is not there, right? So you know the importance of a seal. Imagine I write one letter and I, you know, I just, I just say this is Paul Emanuel. It's not going to have any authority. But the moment there's a seal on it, that seal will signify that you belong to this organization. Right? So if I put, you know, All People's Church Bible College, and then we put your marks, and then we stamp it, we seal it, and then we put a signature. So sealing means you belong to somebody. In the olden days, what they would do is when farmers had cattle, right? They had sheep and goats and, uh, you know, uh, cows and all of those uh, cattle, herding cattle, they had so much that they used to seal the, the animals also. They used to brand them, right? So for example, they'll put a initial on the animal. They'll mark it. So wherever the animal goes, so you see the seal? Ah, this is mine, right? It was also to identify some that you belong to somebody. Now, Paul is saying here, you are sealed with what? The Holy Spirit. Now, imagine you take a seal, you stamp it on the paper. Is it easy to rub it off? Can you take, you know, you get these rubbers, erasers, and all. Can you do it? Even if you do it, it's not clear. You can make out somebody has tampered with this. So think of it this way. The Lord Jesus has sealed you with the Holy Spirit. Right? He has, so this is you, he has sealed you with the Holy Spirit. Now the, what the enemy is trying is, he's, going, he's trying to rub out that seal. No, uh, there's no seal on the paper. You're still like before only. What does it say here? He has sealed you with the promise of the Holy Spirit. So you've been sealed. Where is my seal on my body? It's not a physical seal. It is a spiritual seed. Right? It's a seal that God knows and you know that it's there inside you. Amen? Right? And this is a such a powerful, powerful aspect to know that we have the seal of the Holy Spirit. So when the devil comes, you can just open your heart and say, here's my seal. Here's my seal the promise of the Holy Spirit. The devil will say, no, but you did all these failures, all these sins. This is all the wrong things that you did. He said, okay, I will go ask God for forgiveness, but this is the seal of the Holy Spirit. He's still there. Maybe I'm not using it, but he's there. What does Paul say? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, think of this. You be we become believers. The Holy Spirit has come and he's living inside us. When we sin, does the Holy Spirit go away? When we keep sin sinning, does the Holy Spirit go away? No. But what have we done? We have silenced or we have suppressed or we have grieved the Holy Spirit. We have made him sad. So, he's there, but he's not working in our life because we are allowing other things in our life to take priority. But the seal is still there. Right? Imagine this, right? You, it's like this. Somebody comes and asks you, hey, what did you do for three years in Bangalore? I was in Bangalore. What were you doing? Um, I joined Bible college and I graduated from Bible college. Oh, good, very good. 
So why don't you do something else in terms of in, in, in Bible college? But why don't you join as a teacher? This is just an example, right? Why don't you join as a teacher? He says, oh, no, let me. Uh, I don't know if I have the documents. I don't know if I have the, uh, you know, the ability to do that. Now, you have the ability. You have the certificate with a stamp, but we're not showing it. And this person is saying, you have proof that you are uh, studied in, for three years? So yeah, I have proof. Where's the proof? It's there. Bring it to me. No, no need that. It's not required. And does it make sense? Because it's the same way. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The devil tries to tell you there is nothing you can do. There is no Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not working in your life. You cannot prophesy. You cannot have word of knowledge. Why? Because you are just a believer. That's all you are. You cannot be a pastor. You cannot be a prophet. You cannot write songs. You cannot come up with your own songs. All of this is the work of the devil. But what should you do? Say, devil, I am sealed by the Holy Spirit. Nobody can take out that seal. Even God won't take out that seal. It's there. Now, whether we use the paper with the seal, whether we use it or not, it is our choice. Everyone understood this, right? So we are preserved in Christ, meaning the word preserve means to, to take care of, to guard, uh, to keep it in good condition, right? So for example, I say, uh, Joseph, I'm giving you the lap this laptop. I'm going to come back after one year and I'll take it back from you after one year. But for one year, you can use the laptop. I don't need it for one year. Now, what is Joseph going to do? He has two choices. Like always, there can be all kinds of food on this laptop, very dirty, broken, or he can preserve it and say, hey, one year, I, let me wipe it. Let me make sure I look after it well. So that when I give it back, it will be in a better condition than I got it. That is called preserve. Right? We are preserved in Christ. That means the God is saying, hey, these are my children. This is my son. This is my daughter. I preserve them. They are valuable to me. So we are preserved from the works of the devil. We are preserved from the enemy. God preserves us from the things of the flesh. He keeps us away from it. Again, the choice is ours. The choice is ours, what we want to do. right? We are established in Him. Remember what the word established means? Established means to strengthen, to, to make firm. right? You've seen these uh, colleges, big colleges. They say it becomes an establishment. Why? Because yeah, after, you know, when they start off, there may be 10 students. But after 20 years, there are 1,000 students. It becomes an establishment. We are established. We are made firm in Christ Jesus. Right? Again, we have an eternal purpose. We talked about that. Our purpose is not only here on earth, but our purpose is eternal to be with God. Uh, chapter 104, the wisdom of God is upon us. Right? Now, this is very important. Wisdom. When to speak, where to speak, how to speak, how to behave, how to not, how not to behave, what to do, what not to do. That's why the book of Proverbs is filled with wisdom. Solomon was a great king. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of wealth. He enjoyed things in this world. But in the end, what did he say? In Ecclesiastes, he says, everything is vain. Meaning everything in life is, is going to pass away. Only God will remain. Everything else in life will pass away. Right? So we need the wisdom of God. We need the, God's wisdom to understand God's word, to understand who we are in Christ Jesus. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, yes to all his promises. Okay, go to uh, chapter 107. Chapter 107, we receive spiritual revelation. Everyone say revelation. You know what's the meaning of revelation? 
something that is hidden is brought to light. When, when John, the Apostle John was writing his epistle of the, the letter of Revelations, the book of Revelations, he was revealing something that is yet to come. Right? That's what revelation is. Now, in Christ Jesus, you and I receive spiritual revelation, which means our spiritual eyes are opened. We don't always think in the natural. Is thinking in the natural important while reading the Bible? Do we have to think naturally? Yes or no? So you're reading Bible. You're reading, for example, the book of Daniel. Do you have to think naturally and spiritually or only spiritually? Naturally and spiritually? Why? Why, why, why must we think of both ways? Because the Bible itself is a book. This Daniel and Babylon, it is not, uh, you know, some people who are not did not exist they are real people babylon is a real place which daniel went to so there is a natural but there's also the spiritual so when you and i are reading god's word we use our natural mind but we ask god to give us spiritual revelation you understand right so even if we are reading uh, you know uh, the book of john or matthew mark luke john we're reading that. What is it that we must do? We must think and understand and read, but also go ask God, God, give me revelation to understand this. There are some things we cannot understand naturally. Can we? If you look at Jesus' ministry, he's walking on water. Can you understand that naturally? No. So you say, God, give me spiritual revelation to understand that. Why did you walk on water? What did you achieve when you did that? You destroyed, you know, in the Old Testament, it says that, you know, the, the rulers of Tyre, meaning the devil has his throne on the seas. Jesus walked on the sea right, to overcome what the devil is doing, to prove that he is not just like, you know, just a normal person. He is God. He's able to do the impossible. Right? So all of this, we need spiritual revelation. Yes, Jesus himself says, I have food for you to the disciples. He says, I have food for you, which I have so much to tell you, but you're not yet ready. Because you're still growing in, in the things of God. But you and I, now with the Holy Spirit inside us, we can ask God, God, bring revelation. What is unclear, make it clear to us. Help us to understand. When I'm reading this, you know, when you're reading the scriptures, ask God, Holy Spirit, help me to understand, bring revelation in this area. I'm not able to understand. Help me to understand. So, for example, you're reading the Old Testament. You're reading about the sacrifices and the offerings. Say, God, I'm not able to understand, but Holy Spirit, help me. Give me the wisdom to understand. And he gives us the wisdom. He brings revelation into our spirit. Amen? Yes, do we believe that? Okay. Chapter 108. There is simplicity in Christ. The word simplicity is basically uh, a person who's free from pretense and hypocrisy. Being simple, right? Not self seeking, not, uh, you know, um, not being proudful when, in, in life, but just being humble, right? Being simple. Right uh, now, in Christ Jesus, First Timothy one fourteen, and the grace of our Lord Jesus was ab exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. First Timothy, so, sorry, Second Timothy one thirteen. Hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me, in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Now, living a Christian life is very simple. It is to live in humility. It is to live in obedience. Yet, it is also to live in power and to live in authority. 
Now, you and I as believers must learn and develop the ability to balance both of these. Are you with me? Right? So in one hand, there is humility, simplicity. On the other hand, there is power and authority. They are the opposites, but they go together as well. You see, Jesus is a lamb, but he's also the lion. Right? He's a lamb who was slain, but he's also the lion of Judah. So he was humble, but he's also a leader. Oh, great, with authority. So as believers, we must develop this ability. Right? We must know and ask God, God, give me, grant me this ability to learn how to walk in humility, how to walk in meekness, how to walk in simplicity, yet to walk in the authority and the power of God. Right? And over time, as believers, you know, once we join ministry, once we are ministering to people, uh, you know, you're serving, volunteering in church, we begin to understand this. Right? Maybe some of you may become youth leaders. As you're working in that role, you will learn how to walk in humility, yet walk in power. Right? Chapter 109. The blessings of Abraham, uh, that is all the blessings of Abraham, is upon each one of us. The Abrahamic covenant, right? So there are old covenant promises and there's the new covenant promises. So what, after the cross, it is not like the old covenant promises are done away with. Each one of us are part of the Abrahamic covenant there's the Davidic covenant, there's the Noah covenant, right? So all of these covenants are there, and we are part of that covenant. What did God tell Abraham? I will bless you. You will be a blessing to the nation and to the nations, right? So that covenant is also for us. God said, I will bless you, right? So we are part of the Abrahamic covenant, blessing in all things, blessed to be a blessing to the nations, Righteousness by faith. How did Abraham have a right standing before God? Because he had faith in God. It was not because he was circumcised. It was not because, you know, uh, he lived a good life. No. It was because of faith. Imagine God telling Abraham, take your son, sacrifice him. As he was doing that, it was righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith in God. So we have righteousness through God, and we have friendship with God. We have victory over the enemies. All the blessings of Abraham fall upon each one of us. Right? Then we have the promise of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. We talked about this, yes? Adam sinned. After he sinned, what happened? What happened after Adam sinned? Sorry? Death came into this world. Sin and death came into this world. Right? Death was not God's design. When God said, when he created the world, he didn't say death is one of them. No. When Adam sinned, death came into this world. But through Jesus Christ, when he died, he resurrected from the dead. Each one of us will also live because Christ lived. Now, what if Jesus died on the cross and he did not resurrect? It's not a victory. Yes or no? He took the sins, he died on the cross, but he doesn't resurrect. It's not a, it's not a, it's a partial victory. But he had to resurrect from the dead because now when you and I, we will die in the natural, but we will live forever. Amen? Right? The, the natural 
that our physical body will be done away with. But we will we have the promise of resurrection. We will all, as believers, we will live with him. Paul writes and he says, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So just picture this. As a believer, if a, if a believer passes away, the next second he's in the presence of God. Can you picture that? The next second he's there. The promise of resurrection. Right? Now, the enemy may say that's all a lie. It's not true. It's not there. There is no resurrection. How can you be born again? How can you live again? You may bring all those lies, but we have the promise. Is Jesus Christ alive today? He's alive? Then we, if we believe in him, even we will live. Right? That's a promise. And then we talked about reigning with him, and we acknowledge the good things that we have in Christ. Okay. Let's go to the last portion. Let's go to uh, chapter 115, okay, Ephesians 2, 21 and 22. God's dwelling place. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit we are god's dwelling place on earth and so when we are living this earth life we are to offer up spiritual sacrifice to god say this i am god's dwelling place put your hand on your chest say this i am god's dwelling place means god is living inside you the Spirit of God is in you. So if God is in you, we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God through Christ Jesus. Each one of us must do our part to keep our temple, which is our body, clean. I'm not talking about the physical cleanliness, but our body, our, our, our soul, our spirit needs to be cleansed. Right? Just as how the physical body, we need to keep it clean, same way, the spiritual body. Remember, our body is a temple of God. Right? As God's dwelling place, we establish God's presence in our community. Since God is in us, wherever we go, whether we are in college, whether we are outside, going, we may be in the workplace, we may be going anywhere to meet our friends. We establish God's presence wherever we go. So you may say, how, how do we do that? How do we establish God's presence? I'm not singing songs. I can't sing praise and worship songs in office. I can't start preaching in office. True. But the, you are the temple of God. So wherever you go, whatever you do will reflect who God is in your life. You get what I'm saying? Right? So if you're in the workplace, you can't take a guitar, start singing uh, praise and worship songs. You can't say, hey, I'm God's dwelling place. No. But the way you walk, your character, your life will emulate who Christ is. Right? We de establish demonic strongholds in our city. Since you and I are God's dwelling place, Remember, when we pray, when we get together in worship and prayer, we are dethroning the works of the devil. We are destroying the works of the devil. Yes? What did Jesus say? I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who is the church? The other church? So God is building us so that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So remember this. You may be sitting in, this, in Bible college. You, you're spending time supernatural hour or in the morning you're praying. You're spending time in worship. What is happening? 
you are involved in dethroning the works of the devil in your life, in others' lives, in the city, in the nation. That's what you're doing. As it, as it, uh, you may not feel it, but that's what it is through faith. Through faith. Yes? So uh, there's one bread, chapter 116, one bread, one cup. Talking about the Lord's table, that we are one body. We drink of one bread, that is one body of Jesus, and the cup, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? So we are in covenant with God. We are in covenant with each other. Right? We are many members with many functions. Right? Let's read Romans 12, 4 through 8. Very important passage. Right? Now, look at our physical, everyone, look at your own body. Right? In the natural, in your body, you've got many members. And those many members have many functions. You have two eyes, you can't speak with your eyes. So you have a mouth, you have hands, your brain, if you want to pick up a pen, your brain tells you to pick up the pen. So it's an activity of the brain telling your body, pick up the pen. So it's a simple task, but there are many things involved. Think of it, there's a, there's a pen here, right? Now my brain firstly is saying, I need a pen. And the brain is telling my physical body, use your hands to take the pen. Now, even as I'm taking the pen, there are so many functions. I'm seeing the pen. I'm, I'm thinking about how to take the pen. There is so much. So just as our physical body has many members and many functions, in the body of Christ, in the church, there are many members with many functions. Right? Verse 5, Romans 12, verse 5. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If it's prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it for our ministering. If it's teaching, then in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So basically, Paul is saying, in the body of Christ, there are many members with many functions. Now picture this. You want to start, you, you know, you plan, you want to start a church. Now you plant a church. Now can you do, can we start the church? We can start the church alone, but can the church function alone? Only with you? No. You need singers, you need musicians, you need teams, you need volunteers, you need people who can become leaders, you need youth leaders, you need different, you know, cell group leaders. You need all of them. Different functions, but you're building the same body. The body of Christ. Right? We are serving together. We are dependent on each other. We must honor each other, respect each other. And God has given greater honor to those who do not receive honor. Remember this always. In ministry, nothing is bigger and nothing is smaller. We have to complement each other, we have to support each other, encourage each other, respect each other, and honor each other. So we can have somebody standing in the pulpit, preaching in front of a thousand people, and you can have a believer who is you know, way at the back, setting up the chairs, or in the welcome team. It may not be significant, but it is important. Both are doing what they're doing because it's a gift of God and they're doing it serving together. 
by no means is the person who's preaching greater than that who than the person who's arranging the chairs or in the welcome team all of them are the same it's just the function is different right you get what i'm saying right the function is different they're serving together so when god sees you're serving you're building the body of christ he's not going to see oh because you preach so many sermons you are greater no we serve together we complement each other so very important i know most of you are young when you are serving in church don't look for only areas of you know where i can be seen and known it's okay to start small it's good to have a vision you know i want to become a leader or a pastor that's good but it's okay to start small it's okay to start with the ushering team or just volunteering it's all right think of the bigger picture you are building the body of christ you're serving and we recognize each other in christ jesus we collectively represent christ we collectively represent christ we talked about in section 12 we talked about ambassadors remember what ambassadors is you know, for every nation has a ambassador so what does he do this one person will represent the entire nation right imagine you have an ambassador he's going to the uh, you know uh, to a uh, to a meeting where the leaders of different nations are there and this ambassador goes in with shabby clothes chewing gum what will happen i think hey everyone in the nation are like that disrespectful they, they don't, don't know how to you know be well dressed or they don't know how to respect others because the ambassador is the one who will stand for the entire nation one person for the entire nation you are an ambassador of christ wherever you go you are representing the kingdom of god you're representing jesus right we have a heavenly call fulfill your ministry colossians 4:17 let's read that and say to archippus paul is writing take heed to the ministry which you have received in the lord that you may fulfill it very important everyone say in the lord your ministry and your service is in the lord it is for the lord and it is to glorify the lord right our ministry comes from him because it is in him and it is god working through us to fulfill everything that he wants to do never for a moment we must think that i have achieved all of this on my own it is god his power his grace working in us what does paul say in the next portion he says he labored in the lord he worked hard he put all his effort in he says i was shipwrecked i was beaten i was put into prison i was defamed i was persecuted i was abandoned all of this i went through i labored in the lord yet it is not i but it is christ abounding in my life it is the work of the lord yes i labored i did the physical work also but all of that physical work will be of no use if christ did not work in us so there's this constant unshakable and ever increasing labor in the lord yes we work hard but we also say god it is because of you it is because of your grace right the works that we do flows out of our life in him meaning whatever we do the work our songs we sing the praise and worship the teaching the the ministry the evangelism whatever we are doing the teaching prophecies word of knowledge the gifts of the spirit everything we do flows out from jesus flows out from the holy spirit he is the source 
if he is not the source then whatever we do can be successful but it will not bring eternal fruit right? we, what do we need we need eternal fruit so minister boldly in the lord each one of us can minister boldly must minister boldly when we do that we are doing it knowing that hey it's not my strength it's not my ability but god who's working in my life right so picture this somebody comes up to you and says hey pray for me i want uh, you know i've got this illness pray that god will heal me now you pray in boldness don't say wait uh, i need to go pray for half an hour and come back or i'm not a healing evangelist no you pray because you know that you're not the healer nor am i the healer but god is going to heal god is the healer so you pray in boldness what if healing does not happen that's okay you pray in boldness minister in boldness right that's why in the supernatural hour we ask you to come and you know share what god is ministering to you be bold be confident don't worry right i was surprised when you know none of you came up just come up share what god is speaking to you it can be just a simple verse but you need to step out be bold in ministering to the lord right um nurture people we talked about ambassadors and then section 13 talks about living the christ life um just go to page 112 we see there the spiritual and natural life of the believer very important and we'll we'll just go through this and we'll close for today right page 112 the spiritual and natural life of a believer now there's a paradox the word paradox means it is it is fruit both ways so we are complete in christ yes christ completed the work but still we are a work in progress that means god is still working in us you see that paradox there we are cleansed but God is still cleansing us. We are perfected, yet we are being perfected every day. We are sanctified, yet we are being sanctified every day. We are hidden in Christ, yet we are visible to God. We are new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. The old spirit has gone, we have become new, yet we are being renewed in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, in our life. We are being renewed. We are righteous. What is righteous? What is righteousness? Right standing before God, right? We are righteous, yet when we fail or when we sin, we have to repent of our sins. You see that difference there? We are raised to a new life. Meaning God has given us a new spirit, a new life. Yet he says, crucify your flesh. Paul says that, right? It's not I, but Christ crucified in me. We are possessing. Meaning God has given us. He, has, he says, this is yours. And more is available. Yet he says, you've got to press on for more. Right? We can say, God, I received so much from you over the last five years. But yet, we are not satisfied. We keep drinking. We keep wanting more. It's like drinking water, no? Yes or no? We drink water. You can't say, hey, yesterday I drank water. Today I don't need. No, you need it. Same way. right? We are resting in Christ. Meaning, we know that God has done the work. We are in perfect rest. Yet, we are laboring for the kingdom of God. Right? So we'll stop here. And... Um, We'll bring this course to a completion, right? I just want you to probably go back home and read those uh, few more portions there, right? Uh, from 129 onwards, but it's uh, a lot of it is a repeat. Uh, what I will do is uh, I'll post the the assessments on the Google Classrooms, right? And you can take help from others to um, to complete that uh, assessment, right? 
So let's just close in prayer, uh, and then we'll thank God for this entire semester, and we'll close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this entire semester and the entire course that we studied. I pray, God, that you will continue to minister to each of us. Thank you for the deposit of your word, and thank you for enabling us to learn and grow. God, I pray that each one of us will walk in this identity, this assurance, knowing that you are there with us, that old things have passed away, and all things become new. And we are in Christ Jesus. We commit each and every student into your hands, those who are online, those who are here, O oh God. Uh, and we pray, God, that we will continue to walk in this identity, walk in power, to walk in authority. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. I had a good time teaching each one of you. Thank you to those who are online as well. God bless.